This tube contains DNA, but it looks just like water. Even though it resides in almost every cell in our body, our DNA is usually impossible to see with the naked eye. While the cells in our body each contain billions of bases of DNA, in order to analyze and understand DNA, today we're gonna need a method to visualize it. My name's Alex Danis, I'm a genetics PhD student, and today, with the help of Mini-PCR and the Genes in Space program, we're gonna analyze DNA using gel electrophoresis. In our last video, we used PCR to investigate a food poisoning outbreak on a spaceship bound for Mars. Everybody affected ate both the space burgers and the space sushi. We needed to figure out which one of these foods was contaminated with a dangerous strain of E. coli. We used PCR to amplify a short piece of E. coli DNA from both of the food samples, looking for a harmful or pathogenic strain of E. coli that could be making everybody sick. But when we were done, both tubes still looked identical. So how are we gonna figure out which one contains the pathogenic E. coli DNA? Well, today, we're gonna talk about one way to do this, gel electrophoresis. Electrophoresis is a long word that means movement caused by electricity. In the lab, it often refers to the movement of molecules like DNA, RNA, or protein through a gel. One way to use electrophoresis is to separate pieces of DNA in order to visualize them and determine the size of each of those pieces. Today, we're gonna to use electrophoresis to separate and visualize our PCR amplified DNA samples and figure out which sample contains our pathogenic E. coli DNA. DNA electrophoresis gels are often made from agarose, a long polysaccharide or sugar molecule extracted from seaweed. It comes in a dry powder and when we mix it with a liquid, it forms a gel, much like the gelatin in Jell-O does. If you zoomed in on the gel with a high-powered microscope, you would see that it forms a web-like structure with lots of different holes or pores of many different sizes. In fact, it looks a lot like a kitchen sponge with pores of all different sizes running through it. In electrophoresis, we use electricity to push our DNA samples through the gel. There are two electrodes on our gel box, a negative electrode near one side of the gel where we'll add our DNA and a positive electrode near the other. When we turn the electricity on, our DNA, which is negatively charged, will be attracted to the positively charged electrode and start to move through the gel. Gel electrophoresis separates molecules based on both size and charge. When separating DNA, the negatively charged DNA backbone determines the direction the molecule travels through the gel, while the size of the DNA fragment determines the speed at which it travels. When separating other kinds of molecules, the magnitude of the charge can affect the speed at which they travel through the gel as well. Differently sized pieces of DNA will move through the gel at different speeds. Short pieces of DNA will move quickly through the gel, zipping through all of those little pores, while larger pieces of DNA will get stuck in the pores, moving more slowly through the gel. Because of this, we can use electrophoresis to separate our DNA molecules by size. It's a lot like this pegboard. There are differently sized spaces between the pegs. One ball can move easily and quickly through them, while multiple balls strung together get stuck, moving more slowly through the pegs. We can use that fact to separate the balls by size. If we add them all to the pegboard at the same time, the smallest ones will run to the bottom, while the larger ones will move more slowly through the openings and wind up closer to the top. This is the same way that small pieces of DNA can move quickly through our agarose gel, while larger pieces will get hung up in the pores and move more slowly. Now, let's make our own gel to analyze our PCR samples. The first step in creating our gel is to get our mold or casting tray ready. On one edge of the casting tray, we'll create wells in our gel. These wells are like buckets that we will carefully load our DNA into. To make these wells, we'll use a comb. The teeth of this comb will create pockets in the gel that will become the wells once the comb is removed. Now that we have our casting tray ready, we have to make our gel to pour into it. We'll mix our agarose powder with a buffer and microwave it to fully dissolve the powder. Once it's all mixed and cooled slightly, we'll add a dye that will combine with the DNA that we run through our gel and allow us to visualize it on a special blue light box a little later. We'll pour the gel into our casting tray and let it set. Once our gel is set, we'll remove the comb, transfer the gel to our gel box, and fill the box with more buffer. This buffer contains salts that help conduct electricity through our gel. 
Because gel electrophoresis separates DNA molecules by size, it's really hard to tell apart two molecules of DNA of the same or very similar sizes. This may occur when the same region of DNA is amplified from two closely related species or individuals of the same species. This is true in the experiment we're running today. When we amplified E. coli DNA from our food samples looking for harmful or pathogenic E. coli, we likely also amplify DNA from harmless E. coli present in the environment. Since pathogenic E. coli has a lot of similar DNA sequences in common with other harmless E. coli species, the region we amplified is the same size in both, and therefore we cannot tell them apart on a gel without using a clever molecular trick. Before we add our DNA samples to the gel, we're going to add a restriction enzyme. When we mix our DNA samples with this special enzyme, the restriction enzyme acts like a pair of molecular scissors that cut DNA at very specific sequences. Today's restriction enzyme will recognize a specific DNA sequence only present in our pathogenic E. coli DNA and cut it while leaving harmless E. coli DNA uncut. This means that when we visualize our DNA samples on the gel, we will be able to distinguish our pathogenic E. coli DNA, which will be cut into two small pieces, from harmless E. coli DNA, which will appear as one large fragment. We don't always do this when we run a gel, but today it will help us to see the difference between two very similar DNA pieces. After that, we can carefully load our DNA into the wells of the gel, one sample per well. But if we loaded DNA alone into the gel, it would float right back out. To help it stay in, our PCR buffer also contained a green loading buffer, which makes the sample denser and heavier than the buffer around it, keeping it securely in the bottom of the wells. But our DNA samples aren't all we'll load. We also need to load what's called a DNA ladder. This is a mixture of lots of different pieces of DNA, both long pieces and short pieces, of known lengths in base pairs. When it moves through the gel, it'll create a reference for us to compare our DNA samples to, allowing us to figure out how long they are, a little bit like a DNA ruler. In addition, we'll also add a positive control, a sample that we know contains that harmful pathogenic E. coli DNA, as well as a negative control, a sample that contains harmless E. coli DNA. This will give us something to compare our own samples to and more confidently interpret our results. Now that we've added our DNA into the gel, we have to add electricity to help push that DNA through the gel. And remember that our negatively charged DNA will move towards the positive electrode. On this blue gel box, we'll actually be able to watch the DNA fragments move in real time as the short and long pieces separate by size. Now, let's look at what we see on our gel. Here, we can see the bright bands of DNA that moved through our agarose gel. Each band is lots of pieces of DNA that have all moved to the same place in the gel because they are the same length. These bright bands are the pieces of E. coli DNA that we amplified in our PCR video. We made many, many copies of our target DNA region, so there's lots of it in our sample now, and this is why we see these nice bright bands on the gel. But they're not the only DNA molecules present in the gel. In fact, all of the original DNA from our food samples, including DNA from the burgers and sushi and all of the other microorganisms present, is still here in our gel, but at such low concentrations that it's impossible to see. Our E. coli DNA was also at a low concentration to start, but because we amplified it and made many, many copies of it, it's now really easy to see in the gel. The piece of DNA we amplified from E. coli is 400 base pairs long. When cut by the pathogen-specific restriction enzyme, it should be cut into two pieces, one that is 250 base pairs long and one that is 150 base pairs long. You can see that in our negative control, the harmless E. coli DNA fragment is 400 bases, but in the positive control, the pathogenic E. coli DNA has been cut into two smaller pieces. Now, let's look at our food samples. Which do you think matches our positive control, the space burgers or the space sushi? Make your guess now and stick around until the end of the video to figure out if you were right. 
electrophoresis is really useful when we're trying to separate and visualize DNA in the lab. It can tell us how big pieces of DNA in our sample are, and also whether or not a certain target region was present in our DNA sample. It can also give us an estimate of how much DNA there is. All of these measures can be really important when we're trying to analyze DNA. Often, that DNA is obtained using some other kind of biology technique, like PCR, and electrophoresis can help us to analyze the results. Electrophoresis provides a visible readout for PCR, as well as other important laboratory techniques, like DNA cloning, DNA fingerprinting, and more. And it doesn't stop at DNA. Electrophoresis can be used in the lab to separate other macromolecules, like RNA and protein, by size and charge. When analyzing DNA, Electrophoresis can tell us the size of our DNA fragments and give us an estimate of how many of them are present. However, gel electrophoresis does not usually tell us anything about the sequence of bases present in that DNA. For that, we'll need DNA sequencing, which we'll talk about in our next video. Now, we have three multiple choice questions to test your knowledge about electrophoresis. Take your time, choose the answer you think is right, and we'll go over all the correct answers at the end. Question one, let's take a look at an example gel. In this gel, we have a ladder on the left and three DNA samples on the right. We're looking for a sample that contains two pieces of DNA, one that is 200 base pairs long and one that is 1000 base pairs long. Which sample contains those two pieces? Question number two, how does the agarose gel separate DNA molecules by size? A. The larger molecules are heavier, and gravity pulls them to the bottom of the gel faster than the smaller molecules. B. The larger molecules sink further into the buffer and therefore drift in the buffer currents more slowly than the smaller molecules. C. The larger molecules can't fit through many of the pores in the gel and move through the gel more slowly than the smaller molecules. Question 3. You load the following DNA samples on a gel. Lane 1, a longer DNA fragment of 600 base pairs. Lane 2, a shorter DNA fragment of 300 base pairs. Lane 3, both DNA fragments, 600 base pairs and 300 base pairs. Which of the following pictures best represents what your gel will look like after 20 minutes of running the electrical current? Now, let's go over the answers. Question 1. The correct answer is sample 1. Sample 1 contains a long piece of DNA at 1,000 base pairs and a short piece of DNA around 200 base pairs. Lane 2 is incorrect because although it has two bands, they are 200 base pairs and 300 base pairs long. Lane 3 is incorrect because it has only one band that is around 1,200 base pairs in length. Question 2. The correct answer is C. The larger molecules can't fit through many of the pores in the gel and move through the gel more slowly than the smaller molecules. The smaller molecules move more easily through the gel and fit through more of the pores than the larger molecules. Therefore, small molecules move quickly through the gel while larger molecules move more slowly. Question three. The correct answer is C. The longer 600 base pair band will take longer to run through the gel, so it will be closer to the top after 20 minutes than the shorter 300 base pair band. This is why A is not correct, B is not correct, because the width of the band is determined by the width of the well in the gel, not the size of the DNA fragment. Now it's time to look back at our gel and reveal which of the food stores, either the burgers or the sushi, was contaminated with our pathogenic E. coli DNA. As you can see, our space sushi sample has a 400 base pair band and matches the harmless E. coli control but the space burger sample has two shorter bands and matches the pathogenic E. coli sample. This means the space burgers are the food poisoning culprit. Time to jettison them out the back of the spaceship before anybody else gets sick.